As is often true when we begin to explore causation, the timeline often takes us back further than just a few years. Sometimes causes are decades or even centuries in the making. When we consider the wars of the 18th century, barring the French Revolution, that's its own lesson, we must take a look at how it was that Europe was seemingly always on the brink of war in the 18th century, as well as the centuries preceding that. So, we'll start with Poland-Lithuania. Because we have to choose a starting point, this one will begin in 1569, when the Kingdom of Poland becomes the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Mostly, this was accomplished through the annexation of the Polish Kingdom by the larger and more powerful Duchy of Lithuania, but this new state maintained three important aspects of traditional Polish politics. For instance, both Polish and Lithuanian nobles enjoyed golden liberty, the recognition adopted at the start of the 16th century that all nobles, regardless of wealth or influence, had the same legal status. These nobles also continued to control both houses of the bicameral same, Poland's parliament, which was truly a legislative body and not merely an advisory body, and which had been in existence since medieval times and had been meeting biannually since the late 15th century. Finally, Poland's monarchs, known by the title King of Poland and Grand Duke of Lithuania, would continue to be elected by the nobility. Notably, Polish king's rights had been constrained since 1180. By the late 16th century, Polish chancellors described their government this way, the king reigns, but does not govern. Poland-Lithuania was a powerful state in the late 16th century, looking to extend its influence and control eastward into Russia and northward into the Baltic Sea. Political turmoil in Russia at the beginning of the 17th century prompted Polish nobles to incite the Polish-Muscovite War. While the Polish nobles initially just wanted to push their control eastward, the war became a fight for control of Russia itself, which Russia barely survived, and only did so thanks to the fact that the Russian nobles finally all supported Mikhail Romanov's rule. Mikhail Romanov would, in turn, establish a dynasty that would rule Russia until the 20th century. Poland-Lithuania came away from the Polish-Moscovite wars having done damage to Russia and having added territories to their east, which didn't make Sweden, who was hoping to extend and maintain power in the Baltic Sea, too happy. So, in 1617, just as the Polish-Muscovite wars were dying down, Sweden attacked Poland. The Polish-Swedish wars were Sweden's attempt to subdue a seemingly revitalized Poland-Lithuania. Sweden was largely successful. They took Estonia away from Poland, and their victory allowed Sweden to tax Polish trade in the Baltic. Of course, this tax privilege was stripped away during the Treaty of Westphalia negotiations after the Thirty Years' War. This was one of the concessions Sweden had to make during that compromise. Everyone hoped that the end of the Thirty Years' War in 1648 would bring a period of peace. And it did, for many. But not for Poland-Lithuania. That same year, the Cossacks living in the far eastern territory of Ukraine rose up against the Polish-Lithuanian government. The Cossacks allied with a strengthened Russia to throw off Polish control, which also meant throwing off the control of the Catholic Church, which the Orthodox Cossacks desperately wanted to do. The end of the uprising in 1654 meant that Poland-Lithuania had to cede their eastern Ukrainian territory to Russia. It also meant that the Cossacks, speaking for Ukraine, agreed to become a part of the Russian Empire. No sooner had the Cossack uprising ended than a series of wars, collectively known as the Deluge, began. The first northern war between Poland, Lithuania, and Russia lasted until 1667. It would end in a Russian victory and more Polish losses in the east. Even as that war raged on, the second northern war, this time between Sweden and Poland, began in 1655. Running for five years, this war essentially resulted in the loss of much of Lithuania and thus the decline of Poland-Lithuania as a preeminent power in the Baltic Sea Basin. The Third, or Great Northern War, pitted Russia against Sweden between 1700 and 1721. This war was fought primarily on Polish lands, which meant that Poland-Lithuania was essentially unable to govern itself effectively for the first two decades of the 18th century. The outcome of this third war, a Russian victory, 
ensured that now Russia was the preeminent power in Eastern Europe and the Baltic region. For the rest of Europe, the experience of continual warfare had resolved itself into a new fundamental principle, the balance of power. 17th century philosopher Hugo Grotius and other diplomats had first proposed this idea, this idea that states might secure their survival by ensuring that no one state gains enough military power to dominate others. Thus, states in the West watched Russia's rise with suspicion, but were much more concerned with the states everyone already considered somewhat powerful, France, Spain, the Holy Roman Empire, and, after 1707, Great Britain. Fortunately, the first half of the 18th century was largely peaceful and dominated by the start of the Enlightenment, for anyone who wasn't in Poland-Lithuania, that is. But concerns about maintaining a balance of power existed, especially for the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire. The emperor, Charles VI, had been elected in 1711. He was also, of course, the Archduke of Austria and the King of Bohemia and the King of Hungary. But he was also the sole surviving male member of the House of Habsburg. Although married since 1708, he didn't have any heirs, yet. Nervous about the succession, in 1713, Charles VI issued the pragmatic sanction to assure that his daughters would inherit the throne in the case he had no male heirs. Mostly, he wanted to bar his nieces, the daughters of the previous Holy Roman Emperor, the right to his thrones. While a son was born to Charles and his wife in 1716, that infant died seven months later. The following year, Maria Teresa was born, and Charles would work tirelessly from that point until his death to ensure that Europe's great monarchies would recognize her right to the Austrian throne. While Maria Teresa could assume the throne of her Austrian patrimony, she would be barred from becoming the Holy Roman Empress, a situation which threatened the primacy of the Habsburg dynasty in the Holy Roman Empire. So this meant that Charles had to be very judicious when considering who his son-in-law might be. In her young adolescence, her father sought to ensure Maria Teresa's rights through political marriage. While Francis of Lorraine would eventually become her husband in 1736, Charles considered both Charles of Spain and even Frederick of Prussia as possible sons-in-law. Charles VI died in 1740, and accordingly, Maria Teresa was named the Archduchess of Austria, the Queen of Bohemia, and the Queen of Hungary and Croatia, with her husband Francis crowned the male titles of the same. She did face a brief uprising from Bohemian nobles who wanted a Bohemian noble on their throne. However, another man was briefly Holy Roman Emperor until his death in 1745, at which point Maria Teresa's husband, Francis, became Holy Roman Emperor, returning that throne to the Habsburg family. Maria Teresa understood the restrictions she faced as a woman monarch. She'd named Francis her co-ruler, but didn't give him any power. Initially, she relied on the men who'd been her father's advisors until they kept advising her to go to war. One more important note about her reign. During much of the time that Maria Teresa served as queen, she was pretty much continually pregnant. From 1737 to 1757, so from the time she was 20 until she turned 40, she gave birth 16 times. 13 of those children survived infancy. The biggest threat Maria Teresa faced came from her neighbor to the north, and this threat returned an age of warfare to Europe. The War of Austrian Succession began out of sheer covetousness. Frederick II the Great of Prussia wanted Silesia, a part of the Habsburg territories to the south. In 1740, shortly after becoming king and totally without warning, he sent an army into Silesia. Frederick the Great wished to take advantage of the accession of a woman to the Austrian throne. His breaking of the pragmatic sanction led others to do the same. The Spanish monarchy broke it, upset that Maria Teresa hadn't married their king. The French monarchy broke it because Louis XV wanted more lands. And the Bavarians broke it because their duke was married to Maria Teresa's cousin and she'd been shut out of the succession. With Prussian troops in Silesia, Maria Teresa traveled to Hungary, seeking the support of the Hungarian Diet, 
the Hungarians agreed to send troops, and other nations, Russia, Sweden, Denmark, and Saxony, who were worried about the expansion of Prussian power, also joined in this alliance. However, they were unable to defeat the Prussians. Now, Frederick, once he'd captured Silesia, was satisfied, and he withdrew from the war after the Peace of Dresden in 1745. But by then, the British had become involved because they felt the need to protect their dynasties, the Hanoverian Georges, territories, called Hanover, from Prussia and from France. In 1748, the inconclusive Treaty of aix la chapelle ended the war, a war which had included territories in the American colonies changing hands. In exchange for the French withdrawal from the Austrian Netherlands, the English withdrew from the fort of St. Louisbourg on the St. Lawrence River. The Spanish gained territories in Italy, as did the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia, and then everything went back to normal. However, in 1756, two agreements effectively alter traditional alliances in Europe. In January, Britain and Prussia signed the Westminster Convention, under which Britain agreed not to aid Austria in war in exchange for Prussia protecting British Hanover from France. This was a family decision. George II of England was Frederick II of Prussia's uncle. This agreement, which essentially resulted in an Anglo-Prussian alliance, indicated that Britain no longer saw Austria as strong enough to stop French power on the continent, and that Britain was indicating approval of possible Prussian expansion. It probably also indicated that Britain's German dynasty, the Hanoverians, preferred working with Germans and Protestants like themselves. In response, Austria and France signed a series of treaties known as the Diplomatic Revolution in May. These treaties ended more than a century of intermittent warfare between France and the Austrian Habsburgs. Additionally, the agreement came with a specific military responsibility. With regards to most European conflicts, both France and Austria would remain neutral. Should either be attacked, however, they each pledged troops in support. Russia, then under Tsarina Elizabeth, Peter the Great's daughter and Peter III's aunt, would eventually join in this alliance with France and Austria, thus creating two competing camps in Europe. The second major war of the 18th century, the Seven Years' War, was remarkable in a number of ways. First, it was arguably the first true global conflict, as the commercial interests of Britain and France clashed in North America, the Caribbean, and India. Secondly, for the first time, this was a war of nation against nation, not only king against king. Both France and Britain underwent surges of patriotism. To begin the war, a French army attacked a British installation in the Mediterranean. War was declared in May, the same month as the diplomatic revolution was adopted, and the British and French formalized their fighting both on the continent and in North America, where fighting had been ongoing for two years in the Ohio Valley. In response, Frederick the Great, remember, allied with Britain, amassed an army and marched on Saxony held by Austria, but whose dukes had been neutral in 18th century wars thus far. Unprepared for this move, Austria was not able to stop the annexation of Saxony by Prussia. But Prussia's move against neutral Saxony meant that other continental powers, most notably the Dutch, refused to be drawn into the war despite their concerns over both France and Austria. While Saxony was annexed, Austria had managed to retake part of Silesia, and then Frederick had to pause to reassess his priorities. Did he want Saxony, or did he want Silesia? Deciding he wanted Silesia, Frederick marched against Bohemia in 1757, and he managed to get to Prague to besiege the city. However, he was faced by stiff opposition from the city, as well as fighting from an Austrian force, and he withdrew. Meanwhile, Russia, which had joined the diplomatic revolution in 1757, marched into East Prussia and successfully took over several forts. Sweden jumped into the mix, hoping to take back Pomerania, a former Swedish territory which had fallen to the Prussians earlier in the 18th century. Frederick was again stuck. Even with British monetary help, he was forced to reassess his strategy against the French and Austrians and focus on his northern territories now that Russia and Sweden had joined the fight. In October, an Austrian army briefly occupied Berlin for one night, forcing the Berliners to pay a ransom. A Frederick sent an army to support the Berliners, but they arrived too late. The Austrians, $200,000 richer, had already fled back to Austria. 
The next two years were hard on Prussia. Britain was fighting the French everywhere, but Prussia was by itself on the continent. Now, some of their successes were lodged against the French and the Austrians in Saxony, but he faced increasing problems from Russia and Sweden. Still, Frederick could depend on British money to help continue the fight, at least until 1762, when Britain, thinking about its North American colonies, declared war on Spain, which in turn declared war right back. Portugal, seeking to assert its independence from Spain, allied with Britain. Spain then invaded Portugal and managed to secure several areas, but in the end, Britain and Portugal would succeed in driving Spain back. Prussia wasn't so lucky. They didn't have money from Britain. They were now increasingly pressured by Britain to offer concessions to both the Austrians and the Russians and to try to extricate themselves from the war, which would protect British Hanover, but not Prussia. And then, a miracle. No, seriously, it's called The Miracle of the House of Brandenburg. In January of 1762, Elizabeth of Russia died, leaving her nephew, Peter III, as her heir. He immediately moved to extricate Russia from the war, recalling his troops from Berlin and signing a peace treaty with Prussia in May. Peter then mediated Frederick's truce with Sweden. Why'd he do this? Well, it seemed that Peter III idolized Frederick the Great, who was some 30 years older than he. Frederick took advantage of this momentum and retook all of Silesia as well as most of Saxony, although he couldn't take Saxony's capital of Dresden. By 1763, the war on the continent was at a stalemate. Unable to take Dresden, Frederick couldn't claim Saxony wholesale, plus he was essentially broke. The French and the Austrians were both low on morale and also both broke. Peter III of Russia had been dealt with, and the new Tsarina, Catherine the Great, had brought Russia back into the war to support Austria. On the continent, at least, the desire for war faded, and so the Continental War came to an end with the Treaty of Hubertusburg, which marked a return to the pre-war status quo. Prussia had Silesia, Austria had Saxony. However, in the colonies, tensions remained. In South Asia, the rivalry was a struggle between the British and French East India companies, as they used intrigue and warfare among Indian rulers to their own ends. An invasion of Bengal, whose ruler had preferred the French by British troops, eventually led to the domination of South Asia by the British East India Company, as the British Navy prevented French traders and soldiers from receiving supplies. In North America, British incursions into French territories in Canada led First Nations people to ally informally with the French, but to no avail. In what is referred to as the French and Indian War in the United States, British troops forced over 10,000 French-speaking Acadians, people living in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, to emigrate south. They eventually settled in the French colony of New Orleans, where the word Cajun emerged as a corruption of the French Acadian. In 1759, a British attack on the French near Quebec eventually led to the capture of Montreal and the elimination of French colonists from the Ohio Valley. In the Caribbean, the British attacked and conquered many French islands. The French did not fare well at the end of the Seven Years' War. The war had left all combatants exhausted. By the Treaty of Paris in 1763, which ended the war between Britain and Portugal and France and Spain, Canada became British, although the French retained fishing rights off of Newfoundland. The French gave up all claims to territory east of the Mississippi and to Spain, territory west of the Mississippi. In South Asia, France ceded most of its trading stations in India to Britain as well. And in the Caribbean, France retained only the islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe. While the wars had ended, at least for a time, the tensions did not. In April of 1770, just seven years after the end of the Seven Years' War, France and Austria further strengthened their diplomatic ties through a political marriage. Maria Teresa's youngest daughter, Maria Antonia, married Louis XV's grandson and heir, Louis Auguste, who later became Louis XVI, by proxy in Vienna. In French, known as Marie Antoinette, Maria Antonia had to formally renounce any claim to Habsburg lands upon her marriage. She arrived in Paris in May of 1770 and met, for the first time, her husband, his grandfather, and her new court. She was 15 years old. Within five years, 
She was the queen of France. So the wars had ended, but not for Poland-Lithuania. A Poland-Lithuania, once the strongest state in Eastern Europe, was largely absent from any balance of power maneuvers. Perhaps crucially, since the late 17th century through the Seven Years' War, Poland-Lithuania had been ruled by the Dukes of Saxony. When Saxony was occupied by Prussia during the Seven Years' War, the Duke of Saxony lost effective control of Poland-Lithuania. When Saxony was finally freed at the end of the war, Poland-Lithuania might have had a chance to focus on itself, but then their king died. The Polish nobles came together to elect a new king, a Polish one this time. In the election of 1764, Stanislaw II Poniatowski became Poland's new king. Or did he? A Poniatowski was well connected to the leading Polish noble family, the Tsarowski Familia. But his election was promoted by Catherine the Great, who felt he'd be easy to manipulate. Thus, his election was unpopular with some people. In 1768, the Bar Confederation, an association of powerful nobles who advocated against Russian influence in Poland and also against political liberalism for the lower classes, rebelled against the king. Aided by the French, who wanted to limit Russian power, the Bar Confederation declared war on Russia, which essentially caused a civil war in Poland with pro- and anti-confederation forces. On the map below, you can see in cream the areas where the Bar Confederation had extensive power. After that uprising, Russia marched on Poland to support the king, of course, which then led the Bar Confederation to request aid from abroad. The Ottoman Empire, sensing Russian weakness, started a war against Russia. The civil war raged in Poland, which allowed both Austria and Prussia the opportunity to chip away at Poland's borderlands. When some Bar Confederates attempted to kidnap the king, Prussia and Austria formally joined Russia against the Confederation, which led to its swift defeat in 1772. That same year, Prussia, Austria, and Russia participated in the first partition of Poland, in which Poland lost its contested borderlands. In the aftermath of the partition, Prussia offered an alliance to Poland, because Prussia was worried about Russia, and Poland agreed. In the aftermath of this partition, the Polish Sejm met in 1788. This meeting, known as the Great Sejm, convened to determine a new government for Poland. The result was the Constitution of 1791, which established a formal constitutional monarchy. When it was adopted, which happened to be during the French Revolution, the new Polish constitution was championed by France, but derided by the other Central and Eastern European powers, who were still absolutist, as well as by Poland's conservative nobility. The constitution degraded the concept of golden liberty and placed commoners, especially townspeople, Poland's bourgeoisie, on more equal footing with the nobility. It also revoked the liberum veto, which had been introduced in the middle of the 17th century, by which any same deputy could declare the work of a same null and void, which basically meant that Poland's same was useless between 1652 and 1788. Prussia disapproved of the new constitution and so withdrew from its alliance with Poland, while Catherine the Great threw her support behind the conservative Polish nobility. The result was the Polish-Russian War of 1792, which resulted in the second partition of Poland in 1793, with Poland losing even more land. Understandably, the Polish military was incredibly dissatisfied with the conditions of the second partition, and many soldiers resigned their commissions in protest. In March of 1794, one of the officers, Tadeusz Kosciusko, an American revolutionary veteran, declared himself commander-in-chief of Poland's military and announced a revolt. Catherine the Great immediately countered the uprising, sending troops into Poland. To her, and to Russian surprise, Kosciuszko was able to amass an army of former soldiers and civilians who flocked to his cause. The rebels proved themselves time and again in battle, defeating Catherine's superior troops. In the autumn, though, the cause would fail. Kosciuszko was wounded in battle in October, and he was captured and sent to St. Petersburg. His replacement was not up to the task of leadership and would surrender in November. The defeat of the Kosciuszko uprising by the Russian military led to the third partition of Poland, which saw the definitive end of the Poland-Lithuanian Commonwealth. 
In the aftermath of Poland's destruction, the Polish king retired to St. Petersburg. Kosciuszko was allowed to emigrate to the United States in 1796, and Poland was gone. So, France notwithstanding for now, the balance of power at the end of the 18th century had shifted measurably. At the beginning of the 18th century, an absolutist France was undoubtedly a major power, somewhat balanced by the Holy Roman Empire, an increasingly powerful Great Britain, and an imperial Spain that was beginning to fall apart. By the end of the 18th century, Russia was the major Eastern power, Prussia was suddenly in the picture, and, as we'll soon explore, France was expanding its influence. The concept of the balance of power was intact, but the powers to be balanced were different, setting the stage for a very interesting 19th century. <laughs> 